12 miles off mainland Virginia, in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, lies an island called Tangier, and it's only reachable by boat or plane. And that isolation has given this place a unique character that comes through in everything, including the way people talk. So, Captain, what's something I can say to a local? They know I kind of know the lingo a little well, bit. Well, we can say it ain't hot nothing today. It ain't hot nothing today. It ain't hot nothing today. Thank you, Captain. You're certainly welcome. All right. Turns out that actually means it is hot out today, which might seem a little counterintuitive at first. But in a lot of ways, so does Tangier itself, a town of about 400 people whose old school charm seems frozen in time, but that's actually in a period of rapid change. Is this you? Yeah, this is the crab shanty. This is my office. No one understands Tangier better than James Eskridge, a lifelong resident of this island, known to friends and relatives as Uker. Uker's family has lived and worked here since the Civil War. And today, he makes a living the same way most of them did, catching and selling crab. What I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm gonna get a few of the soft crabs out of here and get them into the refrigerator. How do you tell that they've uh, molted? They've got that soft crab look. <laughs> okay. You want to hold one? I can go to hold a crab yep, and it's okay. Yep. It don't bite. It can't bite, it's soft. Oh, wow. Hold, support the claws, hold your hand out. Hold my hand out. Yep. There we go. There you go. Cool. Yep. So not to be a rank capitalist, Uker, but how much money am I holding in my hand? Uh, that crab right there is worth probably, I would say, close to $4. Okay. It's seafood, what keeps the ball rolling out here. It's all about seafood. Ever since the late 1700s, watermen have made a good living out of what this fertile bay offers. The crabbing is so plentiful that Tangier bills itself as the soft-shell crab capital of the world. I've been doing this full-time since 1976, after I graduated from high school. Did it in the summers with my father before that. Yeah. My father was a crabber, my grandfather, great-grandfather, my oldest son's a crabber, so we're, uh, trying to keep it in the family. Yeah. Yep. Crabbing, it turns out, is hard work, especially when, what's that saying again? It ain't hardly hot, no? <laughs> yeah, it ain't, it ain't hot none. It ain't hot none. Oh, so close. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had to, from I had the to time you've been here, that was, that was pretty good. A couple hours, yeah. I'll get it right next time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's clear the outdoors is deeply connected to Uker's sense of identity. It's how he makes a living. And here, being outside is what living is all about. If it feels like, if I just stop for a second, I hear birds, I hear the water, I feel a constant breeze. Yeah. Tell me about the, the natural part of living here in Tangier. I love the work I do, the crabbing and oystering, but uh... It's, it's the extras that I, I love also, is, is the wildlife, the different bird species around here. And then out in the water, we have dolphins or porpoise that come around, sea turtles, terrapins, uh, stingrays. We have an occasional shark that will show up, and an occasional whale just south of the island. It's, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a great place. Sounds like a job with many benefits. It, uh, yes, it is. As it happens, Uker has more than just one job. He also serves as the town's mayor. Uh, how long have you been mayor of Tangier? Uh, man, I'm losing, I'm losing count now. It's a two-year term. Nobody runs against me, uh, so I don't have to campaign. I think it's a lifetime position if you want to do it. But as long as I think I'm making a difference in helping the community, I'll do it. Yeah. When he puts it that way, it's easy to see how Uker keeps getting reelected. But the job itself sounds far from simple. What's the hardest part of being mayor here? Uh, hardest part, um, it's just like when you see parts of the island disappearing. Mm. You heard him right. Tangier is literally disappearing. Climate change is causing the sea levels here to rise, and erosion is eating away at the shores. Some scientists believe this whole island might need to be abandoned in as few as 25 years. Some folks have said, you know, why don't you just leave the island and, and start over? But 
not only financially would that be impossible with most folks, but uh, it's like uh, Dorothy said in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. <laughs> Uker is doing his best to protect his homeland from vanishing, petitioning the government to build seawalls along Tangier's shores. It's not a bad idea, but given this area's history, it's not a guaranteed one either. Places can disappear if, you, if you're not protected. I mean, there, there was a community north of here, the Upper Canaan, had a small schoolhouse, a general store, a couple graveyards, and maybe 20 or so families lived there. And, it's all underwater now. Can you show me something in that area? Yeah, we'll okay. head up there and take a look. Great. Yep. Traveling across the bay, the layers of history begin to peel away, revealing a time when other islands extended across the horizon. This area of water here is called the Flats. Okay. And this is the uppers where a community used to be, Canaan. And another community out here, Aces. Wait, out here? Yeah, offshore. I don't see anything. Nothing there. Okay. And my father-in-law used to tell me, as a child, he would walk from here to that island that's still over here. This was all connected. This was all oh, land when he was a that's child. That's not that long ago. Nope, so it's it's going away in a hurry, yeah. real fast. Okay, that raises the stakes. Seeing that parts of this landscape have already vanished beneath these waters is haunting. And on the remnants of this community, the absence of the people who once lived here and called it home hits even harder. Did you personally know people who lived up here? I did, I did. I, I, there was actually an Eskridge buried up here and oh. his grave was going into the water. So I, I dug the grave up, what was left of it, got the bones and put in a box, sealed it in a box, got the headstone and reburied the bones down on the main island. I figured that's the least I could do for a family member instead of letting it go into the bay. Yeah. Feels like there's stories in everything around here. Yeah, yep. In yep. the soil. Yep. In the water. Yeah, yep really gives you an understanding of what, what can happen without protection. Yeah. Yep. Is this what I yep. think it is? Yep, there are some headstones here. Some of the headstones here. Been here a long time, 1912, 1913. Yeah. Without help and without protection, this is what can happen to the main island. Yeah. Very. Very disturbing and yep, sad. And... Chesapeake Bay has provided a living for the folks here for years and years, and now it's the Chesapeake Bay that's threatening to take us away from here. Right. Thanks for watching. Do you want more America Outdoors? Then check out our playlist full episodes, head to the PBS video app or pbs.org. You're welcome.